Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for NIL Student Athletes as Entrepreneurs. We're doing a series of webinars uh, around NIL. I'm Diane Bloodworth, the founder and CEO of Scout Smart, and we provide predictive analytics for sports. We help college football coaches find recruits that will fit and stay in their program and help them win more games. And we have someone today who's the perfect person to talk about student athletes as entrepreneurs, and that is Lyle Adams, who is the CEO of Spry. And let me tell you just a little bit about Spry, and then I'll introduce Lyle, and then we'll jump right into our Q&A. And as a reminder, as a participant, feel free uh, to submit a question in the chat or the Q&A channel. And after we go through a few of the uh, warm-up questions, then we'll get to those as well, and we'd welcome uh, uh, your question. So a little bit about Spry. Spry is a vertical software solution for athletic departments. And Spry's mobile and they have a mobile and a desktop platform that revolutionizes how athletic departments think about compliance, education, paperwork, communication, uh, and other responsibilities in the athletic department. So it's the mission control for your athletic department. And Lyle, as I mentioned, he graduated from Wake Forest. Uh, he was a member of the 2007 uh, NCAA Men's Soccer Championship team. And then after professional uh, soccer, he embarked on a career in tech. He worked at Living Social. He was one of the first 100 uh, rec uh, play 100 employees at Uber. So I know he's going to have some good stories about Uber too. We might get to hear some of that as well. He also holds a master's in sports management from Columbia University. So welcome, Lyle. Uh, Diane, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to this. Um, I've been following your company for a while in the space and excited, you know, we could finally connect a few weeks back and excited to like talk about entrepreneurship as student athletes. That's great. Yeah, I know. That's like my favorite topic. So I get pretty excited and passionate about uh, both the athletics and entrepreneurship. So this is perfect. Tell me a little bit about your journey uh, from, you know, student athlete to entrepreneur. I know you made a couple stops along the way to get some experience, but can you just talk about that a little bit? So that's just, it's to your point, my journey to an entrepreneur has been non-traditional. Um, when I played college athletics, I didn't have the idea in my mind I wanted to start a company. Um, entrepreneurship, I, like to, I, I tell people, is like an itch that you keep scratching and eventually you realize you can only solve it by diving full in. Um, but to your point, so I was very fortunate to walk on at Wake Forest where I was a member of the National Championship soccer team. I then embarked on a, a brief professional soccer career. Unfortunately, I was not at the level to be a long-term pro. Uh, but that somewhat supports the statistics. I think the, the average pro career, whether it's MLS, MLB, NBA, NFL, is sub three years. And my career was sub two years, so somewhat aligned to that narrative. After that, I was somewhat lost. And that somewhat started me on my tech journey in that I was behind where my graduating class was in terms of work experience because I was always playing soccer. To no fault of anyone's own but myself, it was a decision I made. So I don't really want to view this as something I'm upset about. It was a decision I was willing to make. But when I was entering the job market, I had no credible work experience compared to those individuals I graduated with. And that's what drove me to tech because I heard things about tech being fast paced, non traditional back backgrounds, like you didn't have to always go to a best school to get a job there. You didn't have to have many sort of internships. It was more of, hey, you somewhat can get what you put in, which somewhat reminded me of sports, which allowed me to gravitate towards the industry. And that's how I got my start in tech was working for a company in DC, Living Social. Unfortunately, they no longer exist, but that led me to Uber shortly after where I spent six years from 2012 to 2018 at Uber. And then Columbia for grad school. And in grad school, I started Spry. Um, to answer your question from a macro perspective, being a collegiate athlete, you have a lot of innate traits that make you a great entrepreneur, a great worker, in my opinion. You're hardworking. You're coachable. You're hungry. Um, you don't like to settle for being average, right? No, no college athlete, they want to play. They want to be the best. So they're always pushing themselves to succeed in those I would say three traits or principles are really great skills to now leverage in your corporate life, 
whether it's like taking feedback from your manager, how you can improve, because many athletes can now take that feedback and work towards achieving those goals. Like your hunger of wanting to always push yourself forward or be the best of yourself. So my soccer background or just being a collegiate athlete allowed me to transition, I think, relatively positively to the corporate atmosphere. But I said, it just takes time sometimes to find your place or get comfortable with this is now your new future. And I think that's the hardest part about the transition. Yeah, that's great. And I've heard from other student athletes that they don't always quite have those internships and experience because it's a full time job to go to school and play a, a sport at the highest levels. Uh, there, there's not a lot of time to do that and quite figure it out. So I love that and agree with you about those skills. That's what uh, that's what I look for for people for our team as well. So that's great. Um, so. What advice would you give to student athletes today who are interested in NIL? Because they are really becoming entrepreneurs once they start uh, their, their NIL path. I have a lot of advice. I, I would stick to my top three is you have to put in work to be successful at NIL. And I think, unfortunately, that there's a common misnomer is that this would be easy for some athletes. Like, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a second job or it's a part-time job. So you have to put in work. Like, unless you are the, the upper echelon of collegiate athlete or you have a million followers, this now requires now either a commitment to your social media strategy, networking to find connections, following through on leads, generating your own leads. So it still requires some effort and work. And I think it's one thing to say, hey, like, if you want to now pursue this to be successful, you have to, like, dedicate some time to be successful, I think, is one thing there. Two, I would say is do your research ahead of time. Um, come in prepared. Like, any athlete's not going to a, go into a game or a competition not prepared. Whether you're playing basketball or football or soccer, you have a scouting report. I would say it's the same thing with business, but it's not really a scouting report-esque. It's more of like an analysis of the market. Like, where do you see your strengths? Where do you see your areas of opportunity or weaknesses? How can you now enter this space and be successful with what skills that you have to perceive, I think, is the next advice? And three, make sure that you're making NIL decisions that work best for you. Um, unfortunately, there's, a, there's an old Teddy Roosevelt quote that says, comparison is the, is the thief of joy. And what I want today's athletes or coaches to realize, not everyone is equal. I played soccer. It's the Olympic sport. Totally different than football. Many of my friends play football, but thinking that soccer and football are equal, they're not. So me now looking at the KPIs of the star quarterback at a power five school played in the college football playoffs is not an unfair comparison to me as a collegiate soccer player. But NIL should be about what I want to do as Lyle Adams, not what the market or someone else wants you to do. So find opportunities that align with your brand, your vision, who you are as a person. And remember, some money is better than no money. If someone offered me, like I said, $500 when I was in college to now promote the local grocery store or a local restaurant, that's a really good opportunity for me in college. It might not be an opportunity for you, Diane, or like your colleagues or someone else. But NIL is about what you want to do as a student athlete. And I feel like if you remember those three big areas, you will be successful at NIL. No, that's great. I love that. I know we're working on an algorithm that will predict NIL value uh, for football players. And, you know, we do look, you know, is it a power five, uh, you know, potential athlete? We look at their position because you're right. Generally, you know, quarterbacks are going to get a little more than the linemen. And then we look at their social media presence. So regardless of your sport or your position, you can build that social media presence if you're if you're engaging and unique. But you're right. It's got to be authentic, too. So. Love those recommendations. Now, I know one aspect of SPRI is NIL compliance. So can you talk a little bit about that and what you guys are doing in NIL compliance? So it's, it's, it's no great question. So it's a combination of education and compliance. So our NIL management solution allows student athletes to disclose their opportunities. I would say 98% of school NIL policies have a disclosure element, which now SPRI satisfies. So each student athlete on campus has the SPRI mobile application on their smartphone. When they arrive, when they either sign or about to sign an NIL disclosure, they can answer five to seven questions via your app, submit it to their uh, athletic department with the athletic department, not either approve, reject, 
adjudicate based on what that school or state NIL policy is. At the same time, our platform offers over 200 pieces of educational resources for student athletes. Unfortunately, not every athlete is going to have an agent or a brand manager to help them now navigate this space. So our educational content is, I would say, it's more practical education. So it teaches people now hard skills to be successful in IL. Like what is in perpetuity? How to now handle contracts? You know, you have a list of resources that you should probably think about before you move forward with the contract or a list of questions you should ask yourself, right? Our goal was to help the 95% of student athletes. Right. Because like, unfortunately, like going back to myself, I wasn't going to make five figure deals. At least I don't think so. So it's really hard now to hire professional representation, whether it's an agent or a lawyer to review a contract. So our goal was to provide student athletes with the resources so they can now make these informed decisions or ask these questions to protect themselves at the long tail. Because that was always my goal. Like, How do you protect the masses? Yes, the. Those in you know, the CBS commercials during March Madness or the ESPN commercials during Women's March Madness will have help, but most collegiate athletes aren't that top 5%, so they're navigating this on their own. So for me, helping them be successful and succeed was the primary objective of a lot of our practical education, but also now using knowing that NIL was going to be a building block for many. Like, and what I mean by that is like, maybe you start a business in college. Right, and you use that business to get a job, a full-time job once you graduate, or you, whatever those, the concrete skills you now learn in college via NIL allows you to now find an internship, find your first job. So for me, NIL is kind of a stepping stone for many athletes. It gives you your first-hand look at business, and from those skills and lessons, that can set you up on the path to be successful post-graduation. Yeah, totally agree with that. I know I've done a couple of NIL deals with athletes and I really try to mentor them a little bit, at least about the business aspects of it, you know, what they need to think about contractually, you know, I require them to send me an invoice and do those things that they're going to be forced to do in the business world, uh, just to get on get on track there. But I think I think that's great. As you know, NIL is ever evolving. So what are some of the trends that you see with NIL right now, especially in terms of compliance? I mean, what are some of the athletic departments uh, concerned about right now? I would say just general concern is information. Like, unfortunately, like things are not uniform. Things change by state to state, yeah. uh, month yeah. to month, which is very challenging, I think, on from administrators, but also athletes. It's very hard to teach you something if I'm what I'm trying to teach you is constantly changing um, from an athlete's perspective. But then also now, how do these administration make administrations now handle your diverse student athlete population? Like to be a D1 school, you have to sponsor at least 14 sports. So based on that now, you have different athletes from different backgrounds with different valuations or different expectations with NIL. So how do you not provide education resources or just information that now caters to each cohort of student athlete? I think it's one of the biggest challenges right now is saying, how do we support our athletes? Yes, it's easy to support a handful of athletes, but how do you support the entire department? And you can kind of see that was unfortunately some of the NIL metrics that have been shared openly, right? Like the average deal value and the median deal value are thousands of dollars apart. Right. So, yes, there are some people who are making substantial incomes, five figure contracts, where there are some people now with a median value of around 350. Right. So I think that's just the challenge that will always persist in the space. But how do you now, I think, a successful program says, hey, how do I now increase the median value going forward? Right. Like every year or the next over the next semester or quarter, can we now increase that by 10 to 15 percent? If they can increase the median value at a school, it means NIL is successful, their campaigns, their education, because now all athletes are benefiting from it, not just the top earners or the most popular or visible athletes. I would say some other challenges are um, just what's going to happen in the future. I, I don't know. Like I think yeah. many schools are want to provide support for their athletes, but how the laws are written makes it feasible in some places and not feasible in other places. And I think that is now actually unfair to the athlete at the end of the day, because you're not really playing against the fair set of fair cards, right? Some schools that have other resources that your school is not permitted to have. So hopefully some uniformity or consistency would, would, would arise. 
Um, and then it's just like resources and headcount. Unfortunately, FMX is in a really tough spot headcount wise and personnel wise. There's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of change in athletic departments. And that I think only now hurts the athletes because you don't really have a dedicated person to help you. And if you do, that person might have three, four jobs, right? So how do you now make sure that that person has the time and resources to focus on you or set athletes to be successful? No, that's great. Um, and, you know, I think everyone wants to maybe see some federal legislation here. So if there is some uniformity and it's not, you know, state legislation and it's okay in one state and not in another. And it, it gets very complex. So I, I no doubt we're going to see some change in this. I'm not, I'm not um, I joke and say we should develop an algorithm to say which of these federal uh, bills is actually going to pass because I have no idea. But uh, but maybe there there should be well, a prediction there. If, you know, if, if you look at it this way, NIL will be what, officially two years old this summer. It's immature at this point. Yeah. You're going to have some changes. You're going to have to have some growing pains. And I think we're, we're in that midst of seeing those. But going forward, I'm optimistic that, you know, we will figure it out. But I said, we're only two years in, right? A lot of things will now change that for comparison, like look at our smartphones, if you, don't, if you recall. Generation number one of, or generation two of the smartphone did not have internet do not have Google Maps, do not have any of the things that we've grown very like accustomed to now. And that evolution happened over the span of what, 10 years, right? So imagine where NIL will now be by the end of the decade, 2030. I think it's a totally different world that we are now, but I think the key is to be open to change, but at the same time now communicate change as a way that allows people to now understand and, and navigate these changes. Yeah, no, that's great. And you talked about these metrics that the athletic departments are starting to capture. And it kind of leads to my next question, which, you know, I would ask is, you know, are they talking about their NIL, their student athletes with NIL deals during the recruiting process? Has that become an important part of the recruiting process? I'm sure it has in some places. I'm sure it's not in some places. It's very difficult to say because we do provide reporting fee capabilities within the platform, but how schools use and leverage them, I'm not really privy to on that sense. We do generate quarterly or you know, semester reports of like high level takeaways from the industry and findings that we have. So I definitely think it will be, it is there in the space. How coaches use it, how other coaches use it, I'm unaware of. But I think it's just it's, it becomes part of your I would say overall recruiting approach, or at least for some sports, where you know me being a soccer player, NIL might not be the top thing in my draw. Yeah, my, yeah, my draw for a school. But if I'm playing a different sport in a different locale, maybe it's a lot more prevalent, right? So I think there's a lot to your point now from an algorithm standpoint, just math. I think there's a lot of different components that factor into why student athletes select certain schools. And I definitely know NIL is one of those components for some athletes. So coaches obviously are going to now lean into that. But do I think it's the only component? I disagree because you have like tradition, pedigree. Playing time is a big one, right? Like I said, you can go to a place and make a ton of money via NIL. But if you never play and your, and your ambitions are either an Olympics, being a professional athlete, you kind of have to play. So it, it's it's kind of like I said, a sliding scale that each athlete would have to determine. But I guarantee some coaches are saying, hey, on average, here's what our athletes make. But more importantly, I think it's not so much about earnings, it's about resources, support, guidance. Because for me, that's what I would care about if I was looking at NIL myself, because it's a business. Like where you start is not where you finish, right? Many collegiate athletes come in freshman year and physically and maturity, they look very different when they leave, right? Weights, you know, um, conditioning, uh, personal development. I think NIL is something that you will now want to cover in that pitch to a young man or young woman saying, hey, you come here in three, four years of our coaching development, you can now be here for those athletes. And I think that's actually a, a lot more valuable as a talking point or a recruiting tactic than promising dollar amounts because you can't really promise dollar amounts. You can, but like the market will pay what the market wants to pay. And that's unfortunately something you really can't control long term because as we've seen in the past 18 months, 
the macroeconomic scale changes all the time, right? Companies are pulling back now in marketing dollars. So an NIL could be argued as affiliate marketing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, one more question, and then I just want to open it up to for any Q and A uh, from our participants, our attendees today. So, if you want to enter those questions uh, into chat or the Q and A window, uh, we'll do them. But kind of uh, one question before we get into to audience participation, while is. Um, I know what we're seeing this at all levels of play. I mean, we look at, we're seeing, you know, some athletes, D2, D3, athletes that have a really good social media presence. And at least in the local area or sometimes with bigger brands, they're getting NIL deals too. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what you're seeing across the different levels of play? NIL is for everyone, in short. Uh, I think it's the best way to say it is whether you were at a blue blood football program or you were at a, um, D3 football program, the NIL opportunities for every student athlete out there. But one, the student athlete has to be willing to go work and find them to some extent. But thinking is just now concentrated now for the top athletes for the top programs, I think is a, a false narrative that I hope, you know, it, it continues to get dispelled as we get more and more NIL data. Um, to be honest, I think a lot of the D2 and D3 schools have a really powerful place in the NIL ecosystem because many of them are in locations that have no competition. They are the big sport in town. They are the big sport in that community. Whereas you could be at a power five school in a large metropolitan area and have two NFL teams, an NBA team, a soccer team, a hockey team. Yeah. It's tough to get business. Whereas you could be the big fish in a small pond at some of these other institutions. So I think that is something we've definitely seen. Uh, in terms of how the NCAA guidelines are actually written, whether it's bylaws for practice competition, time management, a lot of D2 and D3 athletes have actually more time to participate and invest in their NIL than some of their D1, um, I would say, colleagues, just based on how time management laws are written. Many of these student athletes also have less scholarships at the D2 and D3 level. So NIL could be a way to supplement your tuition, supplement your earnings if done properly. And I guess the final piece is many administrators at that level are pursuing NIL for the right things. Student athlete empowerment, education. How do I put that young man or young woman on a better path to success after their four or three and a half years at my institution? Because they're in it for the right reasons, the growth, the development of the person, and NIL, or I like to say practical education or real life entrepreneurship is an easy way to ensure that your graduating seniors are successful. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love what you said about them kind of going after it too. I know I just, uh, our last uh, event in this NIL series, we're actually going to host a panel here at Atlanta Tech Village uh, where our office is located and we're including different perspectives on NIL. And I wanted to hire a student athlete through NIL uh, to participate on that panel. And I, you know, the ones that stood out to me, a lot applied for that post uh, that I put on Open Doors, but uh, the ones that stood out to me were the ones that followed up and sent me a DM on Twitter or a message and said, hey, you need to select me and this is why you need to select me. You know, they they weren't passive. They were active in pursuing well, that opportunity. That. It's like a job interview or being, you know, productive in the workplace. Like those are the skills I, I learned when I got my first job. I wish I had learned those skills in college. I think NIL gives you the opportunity to learn those in a controlled and safe environment, right? So when you now enter the workforce, your networking, your communication, your business acumen is somewhat polished. So these young men and young women are really successful. I think that's where the true value of NIL will be in, in five to 10 years is the schools that have dedicated NIL resources or programming. Can you look at the athletes that have gone through those programs? Where are they now five years after graduation or 10 years from graduation? Are they entrepreneurs? Do they have their own business? Have they been successful in whatever ventures they have? Because for me, that's a really great indicator of how good your program is. Like, yes, dollar amounts in college are one KPI that you can track. But more of the long term is like what happens post graduation and once you now have your foot in, you know, corporate life. Absolutely. There'll be some great stories there. All right. We have a question in our Q&A. Um, I'm interested in what are the top maybe two to three most critical components for NIL compliance for the athletes? What did the athletes need to be thinking about? Contracts, 
contracts, contracts slash expectations or deliverables. Um, all student athletes should sign some form of contract. Um, if you don't, if you don't have a lawyer, ask a friend to review the contract uh, on your behalf. See if you know through your extended network or someone on campus, whether it's a pre-law student or someone in the law school. Ask them to just see if they can help you with the contract. Um, unfortunately, there are some bad actors in the world who want to take advantage of student athletes, and some contract language is not friendly for the student athlete. Like, yes, they want to work with you, but in perpetuity is not a clause that I would ever put in a contract for a young man and young woman. So I think contracts are important. Next thing, I would I would time bound your NIL opportunities, student athletes, one year. All contracts should be one year in my eyes. Why? Because who you are as a freshman could be totally different than you are as a junior, right? You could redshirt your freshman year, whereas junior year could be an all-conference player, an all-American. And based on those individual accolades, your value is significantly higher junior year than it was freshman year, but signing a four-year blanket deal does not really give you the opportunity to maximize your earning potential when you have the chance to. And I would say the final piece is to think about from a contract perspective is deliverables. Clearly outline what are your expectations from this deal or what the brand third party that you're working with wants and what you want from them. Having that written down ahead of time ensures that you're going into this now with the understanding of how people are aligned. Because unfortunately, you might think they want to now, your LinkedIn post is good enough or your, your Instagram reel is good enough and they'll tell you it's not. And they want four revisions. But if that's not outlined on the contract, you have a back and forth now that can only now lead to stress, confusion, and anxiety, which I think can be avoided by saying, hey, here are the deliverables. I will now provide one reel with three edits, right? Here are the dates. Like, yes, it's a little more proactive work up front, but that work up front, I think, just leads to more peace of mind and happiness on the back end. No, that's great. And I think that that's how the real world, world works, right? We're going to look for like those number of edits. I know one of the uh, student athletes, it was a, a recruit that had gotten like 50 offers on Scout Smart. And so we had him endorse us. And, you know, I would say, I want you to send me a report every month of the engagement metrics around, you know, from your social media around that. We tried to be very clear and then he he would provide that to us. And, and it gives accountability, but I think it also drives behavior too. So I think it works on both the business side and the the student athlete side to have good clarity on what you want to get out of the, the agreement. No, absolutely. I think you're spot on. All right. I think we have another question here. Let's see. Um, so who is ultimately responsible for NIL compliance? Is it the athlete, the coach, and or the school? I think it's, I think everyone is responsible. And what I mean by that is you're not, as a parent for those who are parents or those who have children or those who were children, your parents taught you to cross, look both ways before you cross the street. They taught, they taught, they taught you not to talk to strangers. Ultimately, as a child, I still have to now take my parents' advice, right? So that's why I think NIL kind of falls within that. I know the analogy might be a stretch, but Coaches should encourage their student athletes to pursue NIL, but at the same time, encourage them to follow the rules that the school has set forth, encourage them to sign contracts, encourage them to do what they feel comfortable with, right? Because the school can lead a student athlete to water, but the student athlete still has to drink, right? So I think all three have a big role in this because many forget that collegiate athletics has a kind of paternal, maternal nature to it, in that my college soccer coach told my parents he would look after me. And that's now where the trick comes with NIL, because some schools can't really help to a certain extent based on their state laws or their school guidelines. But student athletes still respect and value their coaches or their senior leadership's opinions and thoughts, right? So as a result of that, one, I think the school should have resources in place to make sure their athletes can find information, can ask questions, or have a resource library but also now putting a system in place where athletes can share disclosures with you is not to hinder the athlete's earning potential. It's just to understand what they're doing because that data can be now used and leveraged to either now tweak your educational curriculum, provide other resources to your athletes 
based on what they've now seen in the space. So you're, they're constantly up to date on the trends or what's going on. So you're kind of empowering them. But at the same time, athletes now, I think I should try to honor what the school's policy or follow those guidance or rules. Like, yes, it might appear that it's time consuming or cumbersome at times, but you still sign your preseason paperwork to be eligible to play. You still go to class so you're eligible to play. And I think this is now one component of a well-rounded athlete is, you know, adhering to what your school's NIL policy might be. No, that's great. And I totally agree with you. It's There's responsibility with the coach, with the student athlete, and with the athletic department or the, the, the program to make sure that that's all, all is being done within compliance. Um, let me ask you one last question, and then we'll see if there's any other uh, questions in the Q&A. So it's just a little bit about what you're doing uh, as far I know you guys are much more than NIL compliance. That certainly is a, is a component of your platform. Talk to me about some of the exciting things. Uh, let's let's let that entrepreneur, you, the student athlete's been talking. Let's let that entrepreneur talk a little bit. Um, no, thank you so much. You know, the NIL era in COVID at the same time kind of somewhat highlighted the fragmented software stack in athletics. It was always top down, athlete to coach, admin to athlete, but many things were in person, face to face. You never really needed to have software to really, really think about or run your department because everything was meetings or in person or somewhere in my office to sign this form. COVID kind of changed how student athletic or departments now operated, but more importantly, it changed how business operated. Many of these things, these virtual panels or these dynamics like us talking right now became a lot more common and popular, right? And I know at the same time now being a new era, launched a wide variety of software options for athletes, marketplaces, companies that offer NIL management similar to myself, on top of the existing solutions that already existed in the space. So for us, we kept hearing, hey, Lyle, it'd be great for us to have, you know, a platform that handles NIL management, provides educational resources, but helps coaches with recruiting, helps schedule practices, does paperwork, does all the things in general, because ideally, I don't want to give my kids six different apps. I want to give them one app, right? So for me, that was always the goal with Spry was, yes, let's offer a best-in-class NIL educational solution. Let's partner with some of the best businesses and brands and um, educators in the industry, but also now let's provide admins a resource so they can now do all of their other administrative needs. Coaches can do recruiting. They can communicate with their team. They can share comp ticket requests or share scouting reports, but also admins can send your preseason paperwork for eligibility. They can make sure coaches are following time management guidelines. So for us, it was to take every athletic department operations and bring it into one platform. And that's Spry's mission control. Because for me, one app is better than five for many reasons. One, you get to keep the cost down. And in the era now that costs are rising and athletic departments are facing difficulty now in terms of rising budgets and operating costs, saying, hey, school, we pay for one app instead of five is a pretty compelling factor. But from the end user, thinking about the student athlete or the coach, imagine just using one app for everything. I don't now have to log across four or five different apps to message, do paperwork, then send my scouting reports or do my practice logs. I can do all through one platform that gives the coach such peace of mind. The athlete now knows what app to use. So not only now are you getting more activity, but you're getting more engagement. And long-term, that is super powerful now because if I have your engagement, it makes it easier for me to pass educational resources to you. Because I now know what when Diane is looking at the app or when Diane practices or when she goes to the training room. So I can now say, hey, Diane, I noticed your NIL activities, you like marketing deals. Here's potentially four marketing deals based on your major, right? So, we, you, so you can do a lot of great things with the platform. But for us, it was always to consolidate athletic department operations into one application that now empowers student athletes, coaches, and administrators. No, that's great. And we hear from coaches a lot, man, there's just too many apps and platforms and things that we use. We just, you know, it's just overwhelming after a while. So I think you're on the right path there. No, thank you so much. But even at that point, we want to get coaches back to what they're good at. It's coaching. It's developing young, young men and young women. If I can now reduce, give you back 15 minutes every day, right? 
That's an hour and 15 minutes per week. That's five hours per month. That's a lot of time if you think about it, but if that's now the same for four people on your coaching staff, that's 20 hours a month. That's a, a couple extra recruiting trips, maybe an on-campus visit. Maybe you get to break down some more fill. Maybe you can now use ScoutSmart to identify some really great prospects next year at the end of the day. So for me, thinking about time management, how you allocate resources, consolidation has long-term benefits. And for us, we like to work with those who don't have those big TV contracts or those big, you know, those big stadiums, because those are the, the admins that are thinking about how do they become more efficient because they have multiple responsibilities. So that's our target audience. Yeah, that's great. And well, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Just a couple of reminders for our participants. If you're a college coach and you signed up today, we will be giving you free access to the Scout Smart database uh, with more than 75,000 recruits. And if you're in the Atlanta area or you're going to be in the Atlanta area on June 21st, we'll be doing our live NIL panel at 1 p.m. Uh, at the Atlanta Tech Village in Atlanta. So, Lyle, once again, thank you for your time and your wisdom and that journey. Uh, from a student athlete to entrepreneur. Thank you so much for having me, Diane. I really enjoyed today's conversation.